Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, San Francisco's premier author interview program. And today, we welcome Thomas Cahill, and we welcome the fifth book in his acclaimed Hinges of History series. This one is called Mysteries of the Middle Ages, with a long subtitle, The Rise of Feminism, Science, and Art from the Cults of Catholic Europe. It's an N.A. Talese book published by Doubleday, and thanks for coming by. Jim, thanks for inviting me. Uh, we have uh, uh, other books in the series, and I just want to go through them briefly. It, it, it all began with what I always thought of as a kind of in-your-face title. Yeah, How the was. Irish Saved History. Civilization Saved Oh, Civilization. I'm sorry. It's even worse. <laughs> right, right. It's even a larger uh, claim. More in your face, yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, it was meant to be. I figure uh, even people who thought it was a joke or uh, uh, an insult uh, to them um, picked the book up in the bookshop. And that meant they were halfway to the cash register. You got it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's he talking about? The second one was uh, the title was more more subdued. Yeah, the the gift of the Jews. Right, the gifts, the plural. gifts of the Jews. Yeah, yeah. How a uh, how a tribe of desert nomads changed the way everyone thinks and feels. Yeah, well, there was nothing subdued about the subtitle. No, <laughs> you, you came right back. And then uh, volume uh, volume three was kind of more poetic. We we could have put this one to music. Desire of the Everlasting Hills. Why uh, the the world before and after Jesus? Yeah. Uh, well, that um, I, I, that always seemed to me to be the right title, though I realized it doesn't carry that much uh, meaning to begin with. Once you've read the book, I think it means a great deal more. Okay. Okay. And then uh, the volume number four. Sailing the Wine Dark Sea, Why the Greeks Matter. The Wine Dark Sea is the, is the phrase that Homer uses over and over again. Mm -hmm. And anyone who, if, who's ever gone to Greece is made aware constantly of the sea around Greece. Uh, it, uh, Greek, Greek, the Greeks were seagoing people, and uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey are largely set uh, uh, either on a shore or actually out somewhere in the Mediterranean. And then we have the new one, Mysteries of the Middle Ages, The Rise of Feminism, Science, and Art from the Cults of Catholic Europe. Now, you know, th there are two words there that can be easily misinterpreted. One is mysteries and the other is cults. Uh, maybe there are other words as well, but that, uh, mysteries well, to we'll me... Well, we'll get to one of the other ones. Yeah, all right. <laughs> No, go ahead. No, mysteries to me means uh, not you know, uh, not the uh, not uh, a police procedural right, or anything right, like right. that, but uh, the old word that was first used to describe the rites of Demeter, the serial goddess of the ancient Greeks, and they were se secret rites, and uh, no, and, and in fact, nobody to this day knows what went on in those rites. They were kept secret for a thousand years. And then they went away, so we don't really know anything about them. But the early Greek church described its own liturgies and its own rituals as mysteries, mysteria, and they used the same word. Um, not because they were secret, they were no longer secret, but because they were ritualized realities. Okay. And that's really what I have in mind mm -hmm. uh, for the Middle Ages. And the word cults is not, you know, Jim Jones uh, uh, getting everyone to commit mass suicide, which is what people think of when they think of cults very often or some batty religious group, but the ancient Roman sense of cult or cultus, which really refers to the worship of someone or the a worship within a context. So you have the worship of the Virgin Mary or the cult of the Eucharist. Those are the cults that I'm thinking of. The other important thing, uh, the other point uh, I think should be made right away is that in this book, you continue to approach uh, history, I think that's the word, the same way you've done in all the other volumes. Uh, that is to say, you, you focus uh, in a way on the gift givers 
of yeah. the era that, that you're concerned with. You, you, you write, uh, uh, but history is also uh, beyond things like wars and outrages of all sorts. History is also the narratives of grace, the recountings of those blessed and inexplicable moments when someone did something for someone else, saved a life, bestowed a gift, gave something beyond what was required by circumstance. We all know what wars are. We all know what the atrocity of, of history are. And, 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 and very often we think of history as being just one horrible thing after another. And, and, and often enough, that's simply true. But then there are these incredible moments of transformation thanks to an individual or a group of people who can, made a contribution. And, and without that contribution, we would be very different people today from the people that we are. When we come back, uh, we're going to spend some time looking at a couple of these gift givers, these contributors, these, these people who did something different, I think. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Mysteries of the Middle Ages, the rise of feminism, science, and art from the cults of Catholic Europe. That's the title of the book. The author is Thomas Cahill. It's another volume in the Hinges of History. And Publishers Weekly had some nice things to say about it. A fresh, provocative look at an epic that's both strange and tantalizingly familiar. One of the strange things here is some of the people that you that you go into. But before we get to that, I, I, I just want to... Uh, have you say something about the areas that are mentioned mm-hmm. in the in in the subtitle? The first one kind of surprised me. Feminism. Yeah, it surprised Find feminism in the Middle Ages. It surprised a number of people. In fact, uh, one of the larger uh, chains said that uh, I had to remove the word feminism from the <laughs> jacket because uh, if I didn't, they wouldn't uh, take very many copies. And uh, their reason was that uh, if you put the word feminism on a book, no man will buy the book. Oh, my goodness. Um, And uh, since I have a relatively large male Male. readership, um, relatively large compared to some other authors, though it's still more women buy books than men. There are no two ways about it. Anyway, I refuse because that was the word. There was no other word. There was nothing that could be done about it. So. To talk about some of these people. I mean, you're, yeah. you're talking about Eleanor of Aquitaine and Hildegard uh, Bingen. And the, mm. Well, they were they are, they are feminists. What there's, they are. There's no way around it. And feminism really means uh, the pr- prominence given to women, rather yeah. than, uh, essentially or originally. Okay. And that's what happened in, in their cases. In the 12th century, you have... Um, this rise in the cult of the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary is suddenly everywhere. All these churches are dedicated to her, and her image is seen everywhere. A mother and child, really. Very simple, ordinary image. Um, and the, the Father God is kind of pushed out of the way. Um, you suddenly have Mary at the center. Uh, I think that's the beginning of what happens. And then it's quickly transferred to the lives of women and you and you have the suddenly the possibility of a woman like Hildegard um, being not just an abbess mm-hmm. but a major figure in her time uh, the same it's with, that it's that transfer that I guess is the most astounding part of the story I yeah. mean you know I'm used to, you know, all the piety around Mary and all the churches and so forth. But it, it, it's that it's that movement from from that kind of, of, of piety, if you will, uh, to action in, if you will, the marketplace. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Very fascinating. Yeah. And it, it, it and of course, it's part and parcel of what's happening in art, where art is becoming more realistic and less formalistic. Um, and the pictures of Mary are no longer these iconic, distant, reserved figures um, who are above us and beyond us. 
which is how the saints were always depicted mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in Greek icons. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have this new Italian innovation uh, in which they're really trying to bring these people down to earth and show them not as icons in the sky, but as ordinary people from next door. Is this is this part of uh, one of the terms you use in the book, uh, incarnationalism? Yes, it is. Uh, the, uh, the incarnation is is uh, God becoming man, right? Um, the taking on human flesh. Incarnation literally means uh, taking on flesh, uh, becoming fleshly. Uh, and it, this was a very hard idea for the Greeks to absorb because they really had an enormous dichotomy between flesh and spirit. They really thought we would be much better off without our bodies. Uh, that we To be a spirit was the thing. Particularly the platonic part of that culture. Yes. Yeah. And, and um, we would, if, if only we didn't have bodies. How <laughs> yeah. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was that, you just see that over and over again. The Romans were not so theoretical and so they were not so attached to that idea. And the Romans become the Western Christians par excellence. And they were really not terribly interested in the Greek theological ideas. And also, the Greeks, very uh, theologically correct, made uh, made Easter the central feast of Christianity. The Romans really ended up making it Christmas, um, which is the which is the feast of the incarnation. Incarnation, sure. The feast yeah. of God becoming man. So, th- their interest was um, much more down to earth and much more earthy, and that earthiness begins after several centuries to translate into art itself. You know, this has been a very fascinating discussion, but we haven't gotten to the thing that we are going to get to in the third segment because I run this show. We are going to get to the poetry of Hildegard of Bingen. Bingen or Bingen, Bingen, whichever you prefer. And we're going to do that after we hear some of these messages. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. This is Jim Foster. It is Conversations on the Coast. Thomas Cahill is our guest. Mysteries of the Middle Ages, the rise of feminism, science, and art from the cults of Catholic Europe. That's the title of the book. It's a hardcover. It's an N.A. Talese book published by by Doubleday. And <laughs> one thing we didn't even say anything about, it's illustrated like no other book in this series has been illustrated. It, it, it's like a medieval text. Well, it had to be because... Uh the Middle Ages are the visual period par excellence. And um, I, if, if we didn't put uh, lots of art all the way through it uh, and, and lots of decoration, even in the parts that didn't uh, absolutely have to be illustrated, we, 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 wouldn't be, we wouldn't be giving the reader the spirit, the picture. The spirit of yeah. the Middle Ages. Yeah. Oh. And it's, uh, they're beautifully done. I mean, the colors are wonderful. Yeah. And uh, they don't tear you away from the text. They just, you know, enhance your reading experience. I think. I, I think it's a. I think it's a great job. I have to get back to my friend Hildegard. Yeah. Now, when we, you first introduce her, she's being put into uh, the word is like into a box. She's being put into a cloister, and she goes into this very tiny place, which I think you say in most cases is attached to. To the cathedral yeah, and the and church? Uh, in this case, an abbey church. And it's really a little hut that she's never supposed to leave again. And she's there with But his, someone goes in with her? There's, she's there with this older woman, okay. Jutta von Sponheim. Um, I, I, she was only eight years old when this was done to her. I think she must have had some harrowing nights, this little girl. Um, oh, my God. Never being able to escape. Uh, it was something that was done in the Middle Ages. They, they called them... Uh, uh, you know, they they, they were almost um, hermits, mm. but they were hermits in conjunction with a community. Yeah. 
yeah. uh, they would they would hear mass and the the offices of the church, but they never got out of those little places, supposedly. From that beginning, we know comes a woman whose mystical writings and spiritual reflections are popular even today. Yeah. People buy her books or yes. translation. Uh, priests and others go around lecturing yep. about the spiritual life according to her. Yes. And... Uh, you know, she's and she's had a kind of renaissance uh, in her reputation over the last few years. Um, she's she's extremely interesting because she's not a predictable figure. She's she's not uh, the good little nun. Um, she supposedly cloistered, and yet she ends up preaching throughout far and wide throughout the Rhineland, and she attracts. Um, standing room only audiences wherever she goes I think partly because she was a woman Mm -hmm. and that was such an unusual thing to be addressed in public by a woman at that time Um, uh, she writes one book after another it's hard to keep up with her and she has three volumes of letters correspondence with kings and emperors and popes and very often telling them off (laughs) and she has songs Yes, and she I think actually songs. her most uh, magnificent achievement uh, would be her poetry and music. Um, and you say that her songs would have made sense to Bessie Smith. I yeah. do, because there's and, a and lot well, of... Well, let me finish here. You call her, this was one loose sister. <laughs> and nothing is more arresting than the bald passion of her subject matter. Well, it's it's quite unusual. She imagines herself having sex with Christ. Um, she uh, she she lets it all hang out, as it were. She's not afraid. This is long before the severities of Calvinism. She's not afraid to say what she thinks and feels. And this in the songs, uh, a coming together of the erotic spirit with what I guess you'd call what the spiritual. It seems to me that the erotic and the spiritual are always very closely allied, uh, no matter how much some people may try to uh, uh, keep keep them keep apart. Them apart. Yeah. Uh, I, I think they're all I, and because they have to do with love and 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 depth of feeling and and how how can you not and she but she goes further than most in associating these two things. Yeah, she writes, O oh, sweetest lover, and I, this is of Christ, I, I yeah. assume. O oh, sweetest lover, sweetest hugger, help us keep our virginity. We rise from dust, alas, alas, from Adam's guilt. How very hard to hold out against whatever taste of the apple thou, Savior Christ, set us aright. Now, the apple she's talking about is the apple from the Garden of Eden, right, which right. the medieval saw as a sexual temptation. Then toward the end of that, we hear, Thou mightiest lion tore open the sky, descending to the virgin's vestibule and destroyed death. Unfortunately, we have no more time to go on in that poem. We have no more time to go on in this interview. We have been talking about mysteries of the Middle Ages, the rise of feminism, science, and art from the cults of Catholic Europe. We've been talking about it with the author Thomas Cahill. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email. Jim Foster, coc at gmail.com.